Robin Bain, uh, my dear friend and colleague at the University of Alabama, is the author of Paper Bird, The Red Hour, co-editor of the much-loved and admired The Practice of Poetry, copy still on sale in the back, and now the University of Wisconsin's Birmingham Prize winner for Horizon Note, which is so good it makes you want to slap your mama. <laughs> Uh, and that's what Mark Fody says in the back of the book. Uh, 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 the book is instructive to me in a number of ways. Uh, we, learn, we can learn from her about music, not the easy listening music whose purpose is to make the ears fall asleep and whose pleasures are in immediate recognitions and do not instruct by the setting of hard tasks. Robin sets hard tasks hard musical tasks. It is as if the body were a bell, and the mind, as she says, is just a kind of body. And joy, loss, amazement were a hammer that hammers it, giving up its one note of agony or ecstasy, a one-note hymn, as Robin says. She's got a good grip on the hammer. She squeezes hard. She makes a music that's impacted, willful, grave, even when it's funny, fierce even when it's gliding, stunned into rhyme and repetition, pounded into punctuation. The glow of words is, as she says, boiled down to sound. Every poem in this book, in my estimation, is a creation myth, bringing out of a surrounding silence a sound, or like a two-year-old Adam naming the something else that is the world. We get to see it clear-eyed and hear it nervously pulsing, as if for the first time. But there's more at work here than a Caroline performance. We learn that poems can sting. They are, quote, like a wasp that decides on you and loses its strength in you, unquote, and flies away and dies, perhaps with some of your blood. And you are glad that they have found you, specifically. The poems in Horizon Note are an exchange of pain for blood. Her wounds, as Adrian Rich says of Madame Curie, come from the same source as her power. Or they are like the recurrent spider who, quote, expresses her beautiful hunger in one strand, unquote, and conveys, like a composer, matter into forever, which is what music is, which is what poetry is, her insides attached to the world and vice versa. But what keeps the book from being a concussion or an itch is the holy human instrument, as Auden called it, of the breath. It is the voice, the breathing, and the ordering of these breaths into intervals that gives the book its difficult beauty. I'm glad for us all that Robin gave up a career as a flutist, or is that a flautist, uh, to become the author of Simon Tomlinson, and a horizon note, this book we have before us. Because in her taking pains with a breath and fingering and cross-blowing and double-tonguing, uh, there's a pleasure and a tunnel end of the holy all. Robin Bain. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Thank you so much, Bruce. And uh, where's Matt? I can't find him, wherever he is. He's on the floor. He doesn't even get a seat. I just had to add one more um, anecdote to the miracles of Matt, which is that I arrived here after about 12 hours of travel with Simon uh, on June 15th, uh, which happens to be my birthday, but nobody but Simon and I knew that. And when I walked into Matt's house, there was a birthday party going on. It seems we share the same birthday, Matt and I, so I was graciously included. Thank you. It just struck me as uh, the beginning of many miraculous uh, things he would pull off. I'm going to read a little bit from Horizon Note and a little bit from a, a new book I'm working on. I'll start with a, a slightly newer poem called Stone Still. Small wind on the prairie swath that lifts the outer edges of small leaves. 
and stirs the hierarchy of the grass and ripples the fox's ease and heals the silent interval of air split by the split rail fence and lifts the dragonfly a notch or two higher up the dragon's tail and hinting of maple west by northwest from that thicket in the earth where beauty and hunger still can be one thing makes the mule deer appear born on stilts that break and break scent by scent leaf by leaf breathe by jagged shard of breeze jerking on to the next frame of time and in each I am a stone rolled over the gate of fear and I shall remain a stone beautiful inside beauty hungry inside hungers this is called in that year an older poem in that year when men's bodies still looked new to me each one a signed original print with one delicious flaw I might or might not recognize a young man a boy really only 21 gave me the kind of kiss you ask yourself in the middle of how can I move to the province where this is the mother tongue and then pulled back abruptly and spoke in that bottled voice doctors summon when their jobs require them to say terrible things do you know what a colostomy is and then became himself again and answered his own question by drawing my hand in his all the way down his belly to where the warm tape held the bag in a kind of lasting kiss on a kind of third mouth and told me what feeling he did and did not have there and finished by peeling my clothes off like bandages slowly so slowly it seemed he was thinking I don't want to tear her body still healing from the sight of me and then turned out the light and taught me with the miraculous remainder of his body just where grace resides and a uh, very different poem now um, this is a poem for uh, one of my dentists my third dentist in Tuscaloosa <laughs> I now go to my fourth dentist <laughs> so I want to make it clear this is not for my current one but this is a poem in two voices and you might imagine them as um, one being the dentist and one being the person in the chair um, of course it's hard to talk in the dentist chair very hard indeed and it's called slide slide the top jaw right teeth tooth Trough. Now slide the lower jaw left, beast, feast, trash. Notice the hills and valleys, garbage barrage age, on the overhead screen age stage made. If you continue to grind calendar, lender, door, your teeth any more, 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 if you keep on, especially at night, we shall have to keep on doing, or our room, room, root canals, which you do, the do, boom, room, of course don't gladiolus gladiolus not one I oughta want listen la 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 you must look hook cookbook loose deuce for more suitable means meaning meaning by which I itch to express your slide abide what's said inside behind the mouth's closed door needs to say and hide itself nothing more have you considered another veer when your fear career it's black and white checker player soda jerker cow milker as that that sad mad lean back now recline hack hack blind don't mind the lead apron don't mind the lead ape ram stop bruxing buxom brush remember not to grind but there's a mill that isn't so try to relax as you sleep and death comes certain nights too slow questions I'll refer you to sweet speech sprockets lumbering tongue meter unknown done someone a clinic 
quick, click, 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 nit, chick, 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 for help. Yelp. <laughs> never shown that to my dentist, which is why I still have my fourth minute. But, um, this poem is called uh, Elegy for the Difference Between Reading and Being, and um, it's sort of a poem for uh, any of those times in a life when our reading life um, takes over the rest of our life. Uh, writers' conferences weeks can be that way, um, times when you have, um, you know, time off, um, can be that way. So this is for those kinds of times. Elegy for the difference between reading and being. Someone's writing in a book that had the word mortal before the word splendor and said it was what someone said about someone who received it like a wafer. It didn't say wafer, but that was what she thought something famous, nourishing, religious, dissolving. She who decided from that moment onward to be she, self at a distance. You could put where you wanted, her arm through whosever arm, whichever sleeve or window. For someone's written words had made her that sad. The permanent, obstinate, drowning, indelibly sad, sad thing that was now detached from words. And the space all around her, hardly a space compared to the book's field of stars. Mottled napkin, sad stick of wood, still wet with stirring something long drunk. And her mind, unquiet or unhinged, hugely so, compared to the minds in the book. It made her heart big. It actually pinched in its cage. And the book made no place for her heart, not between its covers or its words. How something art is. And her small son always saying, I want to be in there. The picture book open in their laps. And her always saying, so what would you do if you were in there? And hating how that satisfied him. Her friends had hated last month how the poet whose last book was about life had read aloud instead from the new one about words. And she had agreed, not being able to hear the note of grief inside it, that was it. Now came the time when she heard. I probably should have put this in the book somewhere, but horizon note is actually a term I found in um, Gross Dictionary of Music. Um, it actually means something. It's the drone in Indian music, that you know, around which the melody is played, that just goes through the whole piece. Um, I was looking up something else in, in the H's. I don't know what it was now, and saw that and thought, what's that? <laughs> and it struck me as a, a nice figure for some things I was writing about in the book, an untimely birth and an untimely death. Uh, a poem for one of those, The Swim for My Father. He is so tired of being hauled up by the armpits, dressed, moved, fed. Tired of this parachute feeling, day's long descent toward unfamiliar bed. But the pool is waiting, the pool is always waiting, with its clear mood, with its doctor smell chlorine. There's a footpath to the edge that never drives, never. The air's nearsighted, blue. He has earned the right to move among his species here, legs successfully maneuvered into requisite fluorescent briefs. Surely there's someone here who still needs him to hold her. He reaches and reaches, but nothing grabs back. Not the swaddling water, not the fact that those dry strangers, us, are waiting to take him home. Maybe one moment in 50, like, he is back on his lifeguard break, flashing a few facile laps at poolside girls. It is beautiful having no disbelief to suspend. 
The brain floats in its case, and the body floats after it. He hits the wall, forgets, aims for the other wall. Here's how many laps he has swung. This one. This one. That is how God counts. And a little poem for my son, partly in honor of uh, that amazing poem Bruce read to us about his daughter's birth. And I thought I'd do a sort of a birth poem. The mind's a little tardier than his poem. It's called The Seventh Day. So we sort of skip the first part. The Seventh Day. His guy's gaze was still, or already, that of a creature who roams or else is tired of roaming. And so it mattered not that his father had selected two lovelinesses of this world to be his. One bare, blue as scotch or scotch ice, and one set of doll clothes that fit. Nor that we would smuggle him out of the blinding room of trays arranged like a picnic or a butcher shop, the one-pound club, the two, the three, at midnight having first washed the car, as there was nothing else to wash, and it seemed to want to be part of the story, gray, spotty, almost a horse, and him in two hats, like a prince, or a little man selling hats, or a refugee wearing both hats, and already mouthing his part, fur still covering the face. I swear, I have a picture. The ears still stationed by the mouth, I swear, I have a picture in the story of the dark wood and the thing we could hear the footsteps inside him that needed, that never got closer to be found. Then suddenly they peeled off the shiny plastic hearts that had, from the beginning, held the reins to his heart. And the screen, which was the story of his life, went dark, and he turned and started guzzling the silence. And here's a little poem, because uh, Amy and I in the hallway the other day were talking about this. I thought I'd, I'd read this for Amy. It's called Ancient New Parents. Ancient New Parents. No one likes to mention the gate of eternity. No one likes to say they stood there so long, the hinges acquired the eyelids creak. Nor how the half-life of haggardness tarries nor how tardiness tarnishes, triples, or tears an arm off miracles, nor how long speechlessness lasts, nor how the best name got squandered on the dog. No one <laughs> says how books you are meant to read aloud say safe, well and good, but from a watery grave, and I'm not going to do nothing anymore, and well, not so much, they won't let you, and then he was silent again though you know he kept bringing half the earth in in a shoe. So let it be said, little grief monkeys, distant astronauts whom we may need to fix us or help us leave the earth, your first raiments at least were whole, almost seamless and footed, and one had tiny wings and soft and quick to change like a sky like distance, like the distant, extant, accelerating vista. I'll read one more poem from here, and then I'll, I'll read some poems from this other thing I'm working on. Uh, this is the last poem in, in this book, before I read some other It's called uh, Postlude for Penny Whistle, Spoons, and Drum. And... Um, I'm not sure why, quite sure why I called it that, except that if there were music in the background of this poem, it would be of that sort. But I don't suppose there is. Postlude for penny whistle, spoons, and drum. I've heard it spoken of as the other side, as if it were a record to flip over. I've heard it called a gate, as if there were a creek, and then a creek, and then a bridge, and then they lie, Say you will lie amid flowers instead of sores, and levitate 
as now, but there will be no harness. They don't speak of the weather. They never speak about the weather or whether anyone misses anyone there or is it then. Here, summer, God awful, too hot to tuck the boy in. Books stuck to the shelf. Thinking ripening its own intolerable self. The boy's big question still unasked. Unasked and so unanswered as night after night, story after story, mild after milder terror unfolds. Read to me at the end if there is time. And if I fail to understand, read to me anyway. While I'm still flesh and bits of sound, let my son say some sentences over me. Structures like this room, whole houses that will house what we read long ago. And let the air arrange itself, the way a flute will sometimes arrange the dust into the spine of a tree and the branches of a woman and a man. Above me in the ground, several works to weigh me down. No one needs to read them. They'll change back to sound. Or if I am returned to air, I shall sometimes and sometimes be his confidant who loved him beyond bearing it. This, on a night, the heart wears thin and the medicine does no good. This, on a night, the brain wears thin and the medicine does not exist. My son knows not how to read. His grandfather forgot. But let it be recorded how each in his time loved soup and chomped his teeth into the spoon. And how in the months leading up to or in the slow years leading down from his time of eating soup, each stirred at the stir of words and cried back what sounded sometimes like music and sometimes like a burning scraped from the bottom of song. I'm writing a book called The Yellow House, or that's the working title, and um, I'm kind of figuring out what it's about as I go along but I know that in this book is a house that is yellow, and sometimes it's a real house on a hill, and sometimes it moves and it's in other places upon the earth, and sometimes it's more of a geometrical shape than anything, but it remains a yellow house. There are a few other colors in the book. There's black and red and green thus far. And the people in the book are four. There's a woman who lives there at times, a boy who lives there at times, the boy's father who's there sometimes, and a man on the periphery of all this who never enters the scene, who's just referred to as the other, and there's one animal, a horse. That's what I know. And this is uh, a poem from that called The Green Field. And I had to read this because of the green fields here. This is amazing. These, they keep mowing beneath our classroom, don't they? <laughs> and uh, so we're very aware of the green field. So you could just picture this kind of field. You know, all this grass just going and going, like we have here on this beautiful campus. The green field. The way the blacksmith begins by knowing the you is bound to fit the horse because it is a horse. And the horse trots off with this new weight to which it has without knowing acquiesced. And the sharpness of the nails remains for now a purely human idea. As summer privately summons old warmth and their rhythms back up out of the earth is a purely human idea. And poems rise up, wanting to be written all over again. So in love are they with the memory of nothingness and then the first comfort of their forms. And that particular kiss, his beard in her lips like a bird stilled in flight, the heat still in the feathers, arises in a dream that, while it lasts and for the little while beyond, is not, not a dream. And the way this field, which has been glowing all these days, without the woman and the man, in sun and moon, in snow and Queen Anne's lace, in perpetuity and sadness, glows now upon their return with the added sadness of their gaze, although they do not know it. It is only known to the yellow house, standing on the hill at the far side of the field, like a prize daffodil. 
and the knowing turns one upper window into the crosshairs of knowing and knowing the exact middle of your life, the steel pane at the center. And they're climbing, after all. After all, there's still some light. And this is a kind of a creation myth for, for this book. It's a little prose poem. Um, I don't know if I'm going to at the beginning of the book or at the end, but it's, it's about how it came to be, I suppose. And uh, it's called A Story for the Boy, or it might be called The Yellow House Writes a Story for the Boy. I haven't really decided which of those. Once upon time, a horse and its rider came to a place where squares of light shone out from a room of air, out and out into the snow. Golden paddock is what the horse was thinking. Halfway up this steep hill is plenty, thought the boy. The doorway where snow wasn't was as wide and as tall and as still as a horse when it is sleeping in its stall. And so the horse went in, and the boy on its back went in too. Inside was a cube in the shape of a bale of hay, and another cube that was a little table, and upon it a curve which was a spoon for hot chocolate which was waiting for the boy. He could smell it. What? Okay, another hot chocolate for the horse. <laughs> the earth turned a little, and the moon rose a little, until the shadow of the horse lying down, hooves tucked up under, exactly matched the shadow of the room of air the way a valentine takes on the shape of swelling and the shape of cutting and sweet thinking. The boy lay down very close to the horse, and then the letter R lay down on its side very close to the boy. And when he awoke, the boy was in a house, and the horse was still huddled inside the yellow glow, and the house said, oh, okay, you can ride your horse inside. <laughs> Just a few more from there. A little poem. Um, there was too much yellow, so I needed another color. This is called Black Oil Sunflower Seeds. Those of you who are birders know something about those. Black Oil Sunflower Seeds. She set them out for seed eaters. Cardinal, chickadee, tufted titmouse, wren, Whatever sings, distant things, to fill her heart again. She laid them on a rail, turned rabbit still, donned her fog wardrobe, waited, did not beg, until nothing came. Rain came. Wind made a paste. She took the heavy broom. She swept off the past where he or the boy or a god once came and brought the bag back out and spread black seeds among whatever the act of sowing is about. Come morning, disaster, face track where something plowed, squirrel heart, take heed, you are not allowed. <laughs> now those squirrels on the bird feeder, the perennial problem. I'll read two more poems. Um, I started doing the rooms of the house. There are poems about things in the house. There's a poem about the chandelier, about the attic, about different, different aspects. This is the latest kind of house part. Uh, this comes kind of late in the going. Um, after things have happened, but that's probably all you need to know. And it's called In the Cellar of the Yellow House. There is another set of stairs. You are not a drill or a mole or at a film, not that meteor destined for Earth's tomb. Your thighs bear no message from the yellow pollen surface. Hell is somewhere else, and you've already been to the womb. You will need these stairs. You are not blind cave fish, not deep translucent crab, not scuttle, not squirm, not time enough in your life to adapt. And you are not just mind, not just a bunch of words. You will need these stairs. Here's your coat of sprightly arms 
and here's your staff, a little worn, and you will need this mantle as earth needs its mantle to cool itself as inner and outer are reformed, and you will need these stairs. You can have this mask, this set of masks, soft on the face side. And here is a bun in the shape of a storm, according to your hunger and your size. You will need these stairs. Did we mention how the landings are ivory as the horse's teeth? If you get down that far, how willingly, not wavering, his long velvet jaw ajar. So you must take these stairs, jagged as your heart, because the other vanished because it is the nature of sweet hovering to relapse and stay in you, small wind, rough pearl, the silver sound of blood-born stars collapsed. You will need these stairs. And uh, one last poem. This poem is sort of like the... Um, Elegy for the difference between reading and being poem when you get to read all the time, except this is maybe when you get to put the book down, something like that. It's called Lyric Year. Lyric Year. Everything a flower or a shout or sleep. Time glistening and skidding. The reasons glistening and skidding. A gull's cry or a child's or mine. All that seeking after, all that seeking after. The deaths in the distance ground on shells on a beach, sharp shells. I opened the ornate door to the meadow, but not to the story of the meadow. Flower box, song box. I wasn't afraid of beauty and in fact wore beautiful things by which the meadow knew when I had passed that I had passed, a woman in the middle of a life, pebble in the middle of a sea. It is not the case that every one of us is a princess and every time we move an arm, the great climactic shifts, coming floods, and so forth. <laughs> On my private planet, the little umbrellas and the drinks just suddenly are there. Thank you. <laughs>